All right. If you have a Bible, go ahead and go to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 12 in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel, chapter number 12. There was a Michigan judge who found himself in the news one time because of the violation of a courtroom rule and what happened next. Judge Raymond Voigt has long had a policy forbidding the use of electronic devices in the courtroom. Anyone whose phone rings allowed has it confiscated and receives a fine. Over the years, attorneys, police officers, witnesses, and spectators have broken the rule and received the punishment. During closing arguments at a trial, someone's smartphone started talking. It says something, I can't understand you. Say something like, Mom, the phone requested. It was the judge's new phone. I'm guessing I bumped it. It started talking really loud. That's an excuse, but I don't take those excuses from anyone else. I set the bar high because cell phones are a distraction and they, there's very serious business going on, the judge said. The courtroom is a special place in the community and it needs more respect than that. During the next break in the trial, Judge Voigt held himself in contempt and paid the standard $25 fine that he issues anyone who disturbs the trial. Judges are human, Voigt said. They're not above the rules. I broke the rule. I have to live by it. <laughs> Quite the story, huh? One might say the judge had to face the music of violating his policy there in the courtroom. Well, today we'll see that David is having to face the music today for his sins. And it's not going to be a pretty day for David. For what he's going to have to, what he learns that he's going to have to endure as a result of that one night stand with Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter." There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and his own herd to dress it for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he, had, he did this thing, and because he had no pity." And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would, have, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall, not, shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this, of this son." For thou didst in secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Tonight... I'd like to look at this passage a little bit more and talk about facing the music. Facing the music. Let's go ahead and, and pray first. Father, we thank you for uh, the lessons that we can pull out of this subject tonight, out of our text. I pray, Lord God, that none of us would ever have to deal with something like this. But regardless of the severity of the sin, and, and Lord, there's lots of things that can be pulled out that can be a reminder to us of how important it is to stay in right fellowship with you. Help us, O oh God. Uh, so that we won't have to face the music like David does here. But Lord, realize that uh, when we do sin, there is consequences that, need, that will be met out. Father, help us to understand more tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The term face the music is an American idiom that dates back to really about the mid-19th century. There's a lot of speculation in regards to its origin, but its cultural meaning is this. It's to be confronted with the unpleasant consequences of one's actions. <laughs> Hence, we face the music, or that term is sometimes used to describe what people face when the, when the consequences of their actions come to fruition. And last week, we saw one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. David, who the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart, calls him the sweet psalmist of Israel, did really the unthinkable, something you never would have ever imagined happening. He, as we saw, David's successes were racking up very quickly. After years of being on the run and having to fight off and deal with the house of Saul, now there was expansion of the kingdom. Everything was rolling well for David. David gave that grace to Mephibosheth, as we saw. Uh, we, we saw the issue with the, with the king of the Ammonites and all, all those things. Everything was just going well for David, and he, and he was doing well as an individual. But for whatever reason, David, maybe with the, the, the abundance of his success, Maybe he got a little complacent. Maybe he got a little overconfident or apathetic in such a manner that he chooses to disengage from God's purposes for him. At a time when kings were supposed to go out to battle, David tarries back in Jerusalem and just kind of fritters away time. You know, not doing much. We saw that he was... Uh, it was at evening time, and he was just laying on his bed. Could you imagine a king just kind of lounging around, laying on his bed? <laughs> I mean, kings are, and rulers tend to be the busiest people on the planet, and this guy was just kind of hanging around, idle time. And that's when the devil brought that temptation across his path. That changed the course of David's life from that point on. David was faced or given a temptation his flesh had no power to say no to. And he commits the unthinkable act of adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of one of his mighty men of all people, Uriah, a faithful man as we, as we saw him. And this secretive one night stand, though, wasn't going to remain a secret, was it? Because it turns out that Bathsheba conceived a child. David, of course, feeling desperate about being found out, brings Uriah home in hopes of covering up his sinful action, but Uriah's character was far superior than David's in this case, and David's plan fails miserably. David feels that there's only one final recourse of action, was to provide a way in which Uriah would be killed in battle, where it would look like the natural consequences of war would have taken his life versus David actually do it himself. He sends that letter at the, in the hands of Uriah, of all things, to Joab, who wasn't necessarily the most spiritual and uh, human conscious man, <laughs> we're going to see yeah, even as time goes on here, and allows Uriah to go into that battle up to the, to the hottest part and dies there. As a result, David was able to scoop up Bathsheba, and nobody would have ever known anything had ever occurred. The plan seemed to work even, too. As you, as, if we go back to chapter 11, just verse 24 there, and as we see in the shooter shot, this is the messenger giving David the report of the, the battle where Uriah died. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. <coughs> then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as the other. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when Uriah, the, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, was, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. We'll stop there for just a moment. 
plan seemed to work, didn't it? No, kept it quite secretive from everyone else. David, however, forgot that though others may not have seen what he had done, God had seen everything in full view. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. <laughs> in other words, God sees things as clear as day, even in the blackness and darkest of night. <laughs> God is well aware of everything going on, and God was very well aware of what was happening with David in this situation. God was seeing inside of his heart. He saw David's lust. He saw the adultery. He saw the, the antics to try to get Uriah uh, to go down to the house so that he could cover up his sin. Uh, you, he, was, you saw, he saw David write that letter and put it into the hands of Uriah to go to that battle. He watched as, as David had no pity over this, but was just trying, was certainly glad that he could get out of it, or at least so he thought. God was seeing all of that. And what God saw completely displeased him. Because at the end of verse 27, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, God was not pleased at all. Oh, he would, he, and it, it's going to come out in, pretty, in a pretty strong rebuke in our text. May I remind us again that we can hide our sins away from the eyes of people. We can say, no one sees us. Uh, we're getting away. Nobody, nobody at church knows. I don't post it on social media. You know, I, I, I can hide my whatever. Let me tell you something. Though you may be hiding it, though a person may be hiding it, God sees it in full view. And that ought to put the fear of God in our hearts. Because God can bring recompense in far greater ways than any person can. And consequences will be met out appropriately. That's why it's good to always maintain a proper fear of God and a consciousness of His presence. <laughs> and the consciousness of, his rea of this reality in, within our hearts because it will prevent us. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, the Bible says in the Proverbs. It's when we don't have a proper fear of God and we don't have a proper respect of Him and we're not conscious of His constant presence wherever we are that we, we can get like David and get flippant and think, oh, nobody's going to see, who cares? And no, God sees. God sees. Again, maybe we can get away with it in front of people, but never God. Never God. God is just and will always recompense appropriately in His time. And that occurs today in our text with David. First off, let's look at what I call the illustration. The illustration. Now God appears to wait until after the birth of the baby to address the situation. It was the first week that this baby was born. Bathsheba went in labor. She had the baby boy. And everything seemed to be going okay, except probably what was in David's heart. And I'll, I'll, I'll address that here in a little bit. But it goes on and Nathan comes to David during one of those days, shortly after the birth of the baby. And he shows up on David's doorstep and, hey David, I got, the, I got a little story I want to tell you. It's about two men, a, a rich man and a poor man. And he, and he goes into this story a little bit. It's an illustration to help David really grasp the severity of what he did. We'll read it again here in, in verses 1 through 4. And the Lord said, uh, sent David unto, or Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. 
Now this story, it's, you, you read it and it's short, but it's kind of heart-wrenching. You see a, a rich man who had everything at his fingertips. He had multiple herds, multiple, he had lots of money. He had everything that he could want. And he has a friend show up. He's like, I want to treat this friend right. But instead of taking from his abundance, he looks over at this poor man who's only got one lamb. And it's not just any lamb. This is a lamb that he had nourished and cherished. And, I mean, this is like next to man's best friend here. <laughs> and he's taking care of this thing and, and, and it's nourished it and, and it lays in his bosom. And, and, and the picture is that this, this, this thing was very, very special to this poor man. And because the rich man had power over the poor man, he takes that one ewe lamb, kills it, and gives it to his friend, and takes no thought whatsoever of what he did. Thinks no big deal of it. You talk about a gross injustice. You know, the prophet really does a good job of illustrating the love the poor man had for this one sheep, and, what this, and how heartless the rich man was. And what, David, or what Nathan is using is what we might call a word picture. And it has a direct impact on the heart of David. A word picture is an illustration in which the person being told the story can easily visualize and emotionally identify with what's being communicated. Because when you can move somebody's heart, you can, you can really get them to understand. When you can move a person's emotions, and, and with word pictures you can help them visualize things so much easier. In other words, they can grasp what's being communicated because of something that is relatable to them and, and can emotionally stir them. You have to remember, too, this was a perfect word picture because, remember, David had been a shepherd. He had been charged of those few sheep, right, of his father. He loved those sheep. How do you know? Because he fought off a bear and a lion to protect those sheep. So David could really relate to this very well. I mean, maybe he thought back to when he, when he was hearing this story and when he was protecting those sheep and how valuable they were to him. And if somebody had done that to him, he would have been just enraged because of his uh, love for those little sheep. In fact, you see that in David's response. Notice verse 5, and David's anger was kindled, was greatly kindled. I mean, he was mad. <laughs> he was ticked off. You ever hear a story and it just makes you angry? <laughs> oh, it's like, that is so unfair. And it just, oh, it gets you mad. He was, it says here, his anger was kindled, greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. Notice the illustration created some real strong emotional feelings within David that helped him understand the truth that God wanted him to know. Using a word picture, if I can use it in that term, is a great tool in communicating to somebody a necessity that you need to communicate with them. Whether you're talking about the gospel or just dealing with the issues of life that sometimes we struggle to understand. I actually have a book in my office I read a few months back, or parts of it. It, it came from a counselor, but, but how using, using word pictures in our communication can help the other person understand. If you can find something that they can relate to, <laughs> that, that means something to them, and, and be able to, to implement a truth into that, I mean, that, that, that's, that strikes a chord in the heart. It, it gives understanding. Uh, that, that's in some cases, may be hard to understand otherwise. If we can find something that that person can relate to, it, it just makes, uh, it makes them so much, I guess it makes it so much easier for them to understand. This is exactly what Jesus did in his stories and his parables. And if you want to connect with people and communicate with people, this is a good way of doing it. Coming up with ideas and thoughts that might be able to address some things, especially if you're talking with somebody about the gospel. 
There's lots of different ways in which you can present the gospel. But Nathan's illustration stoked the feelings God wanted David to sense. Because they were in some regards the way I believe God felt about what David had done here. And then God's going to confront him with what I call, secondly, the indictment. Verse 7. I think one of the most powerful <laughs> statements in the scriptures, especially when you consider what it follows. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. Here David's mad. And he's like, boy, that guy should die. He needs to restore it fourfold because he had no pity. What a loser. Uh, you know, oh, I'm just so angry about it. You're the man. Oh boy, I bet you could have heard a pin drop in the throne room or wherever this took place. Could you imagine? I, I'm sure that smashed David right in the face. Thou art the man. I mean, I, 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 I don't know how, how David, if he was sitting, standing, if he sat down and he just, yeah, I am. And I think David just got the first taste of understanding the horribleness of the thing that he had done. For he was that rich man who had so much Many wives himself, more than he should have had. But instead of taking from his flocks, he goes out and steals the lone ewe lamb, the wife of Uriah, a woman Uriah evidently cherished and loved dearly, then used his position as king, a position that God gave him, to have the life snuffed out. And God, I believe, gives David an earful, and rightly so. Look at verse 7. He says, Thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Hammon. Oh, I, David got an earful here. And God really wanted him to understand, this is bad, David. This is bad. I have done so much for you. And you go and do something like this against me. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I think in, in some regards, I mean, God knows that what we're all capable of, but David here, I mean, he... It's like one of those things, I just can't believe you did this. I can't believe this. After all I've done for you, making you king saving your life from Saul multiple times, giving you great abundance, giving you all the, uh, the reign over all of Israel, making, made your name great. I could have even given you more. Instead, you, you do what you did. You commit adultery with one of, your, one of your key men's wife, one of your mighty men's wives. The only wife he had, by the way, David. Then you had him killed just to cover up your sin. So you didn't get caught. And he was faithful to you. He brought that letter back to Joab. Not even looking at it. Not even knowing that it was his own death warrant. Because he was that loyal. You know, you talk about a low blow. This is bad. And as a result, God has some serious consequences coming David's way. Verse 10, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. 
What David or, or what God pronounces on David is this: Number one, the sword would not depart from his house. It speaks of the fact that there would be untimely deaths that would occur amongst his family. Remember what David had pronounced in judgment with that rich man? He shall restore the lamb fourfold. Four times. And guess what's going to happen to David? He's going to lose four guy, four children. First one will be this baby, as we, we see in verse 14. The child also that is born of thee shall surely die. That's the first one. The next one will be a son by the name of Amnon. Who commits, who rapes his half sister Tamar? Well, there's another one that's going to die. His name is Absalom, and he's going to be the most problematic of them all. And then there will be one more put to death at the hand of Solomon by the name of Adonijah, who tries to take the kingdom by uh, deceit before Solomon could get the throne. But four of them are going to die. That's a tough thing. Number two, there would be rebellion in his own household. We saw that in verse 11. I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And this will occur with the rebellion of Absalom. We'll get to his story as we, trans as we continue to travel through the, the book of 2 Samuel. Because Absalom is going to attempt to overthrow David's throne and almost does to take it for himself. Out of his rage and bitterness against his own father. He want, Absalom is going to want to see his own father dead. And part of the rebellion will be actually Absalom taking some of David's wives for himself and display a defiance. That's what the, the second part it says in I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thine wives in the sight of this son. Number three, everything is going to be quite visible. Verse 12, for thou didst in secretly. In other words, David, you did all this stuff secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. In other words, it's going to be very hard for David to watch because it's going to be as we as we put it maybe all over the newspapers I mean it's going to be very blatant the judgment that's coming down upon David in the eyes of the whole country though David's sin was secret his judgment will be quite open say why is that why why is God being that way well verse 14 howbeit because by this deed Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. <laughs> David's actions have given the enemies of God great reason to blaspheme the name of God. And naturally we would think, yeah, there's, there were lots of human enemies that would have said, what, what does David belong up there? To be honest with you, when I was looking at this passage, I have a second thought about that. I think it's more than just what we would might call human enemies. I think it's talking about the, de the demonic realm more. Because remember, this was done secretly. Nobody even knew about it. Maybe a, a couple people that were messengers, whatever. They, but realistically, nobody knew about this. But you know who was really well aware of it, just as much as God? The devil. The devil was probably right there. Maybe was the one that had his arm around David while he was looking at Bathsheba. I wouldn't be surprised. I believe this is probably speaking more of the demonic enemies since the sin was secret. But the whole demonic realm would have knew and probably were laughing their heads off when they saw this. And if God did not judge David, it would have given reason for the devils to denounce God's fairness in judging their sin. See, the devils are always looking for a way to, to peg God's people, to ridicule them in the sight of God. In fact, if you go to the book of Job, hold your place here, you know, that's exactly what the devil was trying to get in Job's life. 
than when he approaches, approaches God. Remember Job chapter 1. Satan presents himself before the Lord. And, and uh, verse 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and excuseth evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the, in the land. Put, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Notice here, the devil was seeking opportunity. Why? Because he wanted to, he, he's always looking for an occasion where God's people fail so that he can accuse God and, and accuse us. And, and right now, in verse 14, great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. I mean, the devils were having a heyday when they saw this. Ha, 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 the sweet psalmist of Israel. The man after God's own heart. Look at what he did. I mean... The devils do that kind of garbage. And God was like, David, you've given a great opportunity for them to do this. And you have to, you have to be judged accordingly. What was, a, in David's mind, maybe just a one-night stand turned into a harsh series of consequences that David would have to live with the rest of his life. And it was hard. And sometimes sin has harsh consequences that we just, we have to, in some regards, accept that this is my just, this is my just recompense for what I've done. And, and you have to be willing to be like, you know what? I have nobody to blame but myself. Remember, Hosea 8, 7 says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. You always reap more than you sow. I say, Pastor, that's a hard thing. I know. <laughs> and there's some poor people that have really sown some bad seed. And they're reaping the whirlwind in some regards in their life because of the decisions that they've made. And, you know, it's hard sometimes to watch that. It's just like, <clears throat> you know, but what can you do? It is. It's hard to see that. And that's what David's going to have to look at the rest of his life. But we see thirdly and finally what I call the impunity. Now David does something very important through all of this. David does not excuse his sin, does he? Not once. He's not sitting there blaming other people for what he did. This is real critical. If we have messed up, we cannot sit there and blame other people. We have a, so, a whole society that wants to blame everyone else for their sinfulness. But the Bible says, we, we don't see David doing that. We don't see him making an excuse. He, what he does instead, and this is critical to overcoming and going forward, and still seeing some of the grace of God, because David is still going to have some of the grace of God upon him. He's going to end up raising the wisest son who ever lived. He's going to pass on a great kingdom and, and, and the plans of building a grand temple. He, I mean, yes, he falls here flat on his face as bad as ever, but guess what? There's still a God that was still willing to show him some grace, but before he got the grace, he had to understand that he alone was responsible for doing that, instead of blaming everyone else for what they've done. Don't, don't, that, that's the first step. If you, 
and I cannot take responsibility for what we've done wrong, you will be forever in the bondage of bitterness and victimhood. And that is not something you want to stay in because it will be destructive to your life and you will never experience the grace of God one ounce. You have to take responsibility and sincerely confess and repent of it. And that's why I believe what you see in verse 13. At least a little glimpse of it. And we're going to look at another part here in just a second. But he says, I have, and David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. He admitted it, and he took responsibility for it, and he deeply confesses it to the Lord with great sorrow and a repentant spirit. How do I know? Because if you go to Psalm 51, Psalm 51, was written in response to David's repentance towards what he did. And really, it's a beautiful psalm. It writes here, in fact, if you most likely in your psalm, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. In other words, David is like, you are right and you are justified in everything you just said to me. And be clear when thou judgest. He accepted the responsibility of his choice and he accepted what God rendered as a righteous consequence to him. It says in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know what David wanted to be? He just wanted to get right with God. <laughs> Cast not me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. I think David lost his joy. I think he was absolutely miserable all those several months until finally God said, all right, we're going to deal with this. I think David was absolutely miserable. Can you imagine the guilt and the shame he felt in his heart for all that time? I mean, it's just, it had to be horrible. But then he goes on and says in verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. In other words, I can teach people from my mistake. I can tell them that this is not the road that you want to go down. And may I say this, if you have made a mistake that was serious, I understand there's shame and there's guilt, but, you know, God forgives you. Now you can turn around and, and, and help somebody else not make the same mistake. And God can turn that curse into a blessing. That's really what David's saying here. And he says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy pleasure, good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness which burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. I think what you see very clearly in that is David got right with God. He doesn't, he doesn't dismiss what he did. He, he accepts it as, as his responsibility. Again, sometimes people get mad at God because of the consequences of their choices. But David, what he did was took responsibility and just got right with God. And you know what ended up happening? God actually showed him a lot of mercy. Why? Because look at verse 13 again. 
And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And, David's, and Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Thou shalt not die. What you see here is God is actually going to spare his life. Did you know that both offenses that David had committed were punishable by death under the Mosaic law? <laughs> both of his offenses. Adultery under the Mosaic law was punishable by death. Leviticus 20 verse 10 says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's the way it was back in those days. And of course, murder. That was even before the Mosaic Law. Right after the ark. Right after Noah and his sons stepped off the ark. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. David committed two acts that under the old biblical laws were subject to capital punishment. But God showed him mercy. So I'm going to let you live. You know, again, it reiterates a truth about God. That God always punishes us less than our iniquities deserve. Psalm 103, verse 10, it says, He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God's very merciful. Very, very merciful. David deserved to die. But God in turn showed him mercy. And I believe it was because David got right. David didn't blame. David didn't, didn't make excuses. He just took responsibility. And God showed him mercy when really God could have easily had him put to death. Ezra in chapter 9, verse 13, the, the priest Ezra is praying here, but he, he makes a statement about God's punishment of sin. He says, And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our trait, great trespass, seeing that thou art God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such a deliverance as this. You know, God always punishes us less than our iniquities deserve. You think about it, we as people, as sinners, deserve hell for our sin that we've committed against the Lord. However, God showed great mercy in sending Christ to this world to pay for those sins and give us a way back to God. And not only that, he is long-suffering not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if people just come to him, admit their fault, and submit to his terms of repentance and faith, they can, be, they can receive that mercy of salvation. But even afterwards, when we mess up and we've done wrong, we can, we can come to him and admit our fault and, and seek that forgiveness. And God is willing to grant it. The Bible mentions several times His mercy endureth forever, that God delighteth in mercy. <laughs> I'm glad that God is a merciful God. I'm glad that God, even when we do not do right and, and we make uh, bad choices and, and uh, they are bad, <laughs> they are sinful, they are wrong. He is there and is merciful. Now, we may still deal with some consequences like David does, but the severity isn't nearly what it could be thanks to God's mercifulness. You know, David, he ended up facing the music. But I have to commend David. He takes responsibility. He hones up to it. And he doesn't accuse God of wrongdoing or being, being unfair or unjust or, you know, all these other things. No, he said, you know what, I am guilty. I deserve it because I have done wrong. But thank you, Lord, for being willing to forgive me, being willing to punish me less than I deserve. And I'm going to, as he said in Psalm 51, go forward to be a teacher to point others to you so they don't make the same mistakes that I did. I think that's why God can say he was a man after my own heart. Why? Because, you know, to him, being right with God was more important than anything. Yeah, he went through a period where he didn't. 
and sometimes we get in those periods too, but but ultimately it was David's desire to love God and he wanted to pick back up and he did and he goes forward though dealing with problems that will come as a result he does it with a right spirit and God's still able to use his life to bring glory and honor to him let's close with a word of prayer tonight Father we thank you for the lesson that we can pull out of this passage tonight I thank you Lord God that uh, David